So as a special treat, we've made a highlights reel of the, some of the best bits of the podcast. Now, I love doing the pod, but I think it's fair to say that some very interesting nuggets of information sometimes slip under the radar a bit. But it's been really lovely listening back to some of these old episodes, some of which I'd almost forgotten myself. And it's great to be reminded of all the fascinating mini chunks of information and amazing guests we've had on over the last year. Just one more thing. And I bashed the microphone then. I would like to remind you, if you would like to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that really helps this podcast grow. Write anything in your Apple Podcast review. The guest you most enjoyed, who you'd like us to invite on back on again, who you'd like to have on in future what EV you bought, how many solar panels you've got on your roof, anything you like, literally anything. Put in a red dwarf quote, if you like. As long as you leave a five-star review, it's the it's a really good way we can go up on the podcast rankings and get more people listening and increase our reach and spread the word. So if you love the podcast and would like to do that, we would be incredibly appreciative of your efforts. So without further ado, I really hope you enjoy it. And here is the best of the Fully Charged podcast. Well, uh, I, I was in China for the last time in uh, right. November of 2019. And the reason I was over there was to train them on how to design cars. I was at um, Shanghai Automotive. And uh, when you come to Shanghai Automotive, they have a huge reception area. And uh, in there, you can get a really good uh, uh, cappuccino. They, they make coffees right there on the spot. It's as good yeah. as anything you're going to find in Milan. And the next thing I know, I hear, bloody hell, what the hell are you doing here, Sandy Monroe? And somebody grabbed me by the back of my neck. I turn around. <laughs> There's guys from Rover, guys from Bentley, guys from Rolls Royce, guys from, wow. from Mini, all of them, all of them. Where did they all come? I, I mean, we sat there. It was like old home week. We all knew each yeah. other. They bring you in for, I mean, it was a huge amount of money. We made, uh, we wow. made a lot of money at, uh, in China showing them how to do things. And I'm telling you, yeah. I saw German guys from BMW there. Um, I wow. mean, it was, it was everywhere. It was Europeans, some Americans. Mostly they were with the machine tool groups and stuff like that. So the Germans, they bought German machine tools, American Jeep machine tools and... Uh, right and uh, uh, what do you call it, Japanese. I had driven the, the Mustang Mach-E here, which I loved, and saw the kind of development of that over the last few years. And we, we reviewed it on the show. But as soon as I saw the F4, or as soon as it, I was, you know, as soon as I got out the plane in America and saw pickups, I went, oh yeah, pickups, I've forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> and they're yeah. everywhere, everywhere you look, there's pickups. And then you yeah, suddenly yeah. see the F-150, it makes so much sense. Oh, you know that, you know, that's the best selling pickup for 47 years. and. I've yeah, been, I've been living here for five years now. I, I didn't understand pickups in America before I came. Yeah, but, um, having watched it now, they they because of you could, the size they are, you have the size of an entire SUV in the front, a yes. spacious SUV, and then the extra utility on the back, which supports yeah. an active lifestyle. So I didn't have trucks before, but now I have a Lightning. The front space is for the normal family work or the groceries and these things. But yeah. the rear is for leisure and fun and a canoe and a boat and pick up things. You never yeah. have to worry about flexibility to do anything you want. And that is what I think people love about them here. Do you know it's the best selling product in the world? So it's not just, not just a best selling truck. It's the best selling vehicle of any kind in the world. If so. Right. So that's exactly. amazing. Isn't it? And, and they are yeah. certainly loved uh, by people here. But they represent for me a move to mainstream. So they yeah. were our best foot forward, our third EV after the Mac E and the Lightning to show you really can pull Main Street. At the moment, I feel torrent of information that's coming out of the fossil fuel industry lobbying groups. You know, they've got a lot of money behind them, you know, to say there's no way we can be 100 percent renewable. And it's a, and it's, a, you know, they're doing all this stuff. It's a cruel myth that we're that. Uh, middle class elitists and in one occasion in one article in the UK they referred to me uh, you know are, are forcing this on hard-working families who are struggling to pay their gas bills I don't just think it's possible I think it's inevitable because it's right. it's cheaper the economics are there and 
I wouldn't say that every single source of emissions has a clean uh, technology that's waiting to yeah. become cheaper and better, but the bulk of them do. And I, I just see so much momentum now. And so I don't get frustrated by the politics anymore, even, be, even before, <clears throat> excuse me, even before our government changed. Um, it, it, it's irrelevant, you know. They've made yeah. themselves irrelevant by not doing anything. I don't care what they. I don't care what they say. I would much rather that they were helping, but they can't stop it. They they just yeah. can't. Because that's a really hot topic here at the moment in uh, in Europe. Mm. Is is you know where are all your fancy materials? I mean, on the silly level, where are all your fancy materials come from? On the realistic, actual minerals extraction, it is how do we ramp up the this industry? I mean, they've. You know, they've invested in countries which have the supply. So there's a lot of, obviously, Chinese investment in Africa, yeah. um, where some of the mines are. You know, they've they've secured the, you know, supply chain. Right. Because I, I don't know how many battery factories are in China, but almost all of them are <laughs> yes. in China. That's the, that's the best way of describing <laughs> so, it. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if you're in the domestic market, it's like, no, we've got batteries for you guys. Don't worry. Right. Uh, but if exporting, uh, maybe yeah. not, you know, we'll maybe may restrict supply to some other countries. Yeah. You know, it's, it's definitely a interesting time because, you know, China just, again, dominates that industry, you know, yeah. battery technology, battery supplies, it's all focused on China and, you know, places like the UK can't even get a, a factory off the ground yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Right? We're really struggling and. The point now where people are getting their second electric car, so they've had their first one maybe for two or three years. Right. So I've had my, I've had mine now for th my ex paying for three years. Yes, you must. Yeah, I was going to say it's been years. a while. Yeah, yeah, three years now, and and presumably you've had to you know, you've had to throw the battery away twice by now. I'm just going on the YouTube comments I get. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, no, the battery's useless. You have to replace it at least three times. Um, <laughs> I think we should just caveat that. And go. That's a joke. So there's a dimple on there's the no outside, it, but it's yeah. closed up. So on the, he, wow. he showed me on the massive blue whale. I mean, we're probably not supposed to be talking about blue whales, but on the massive <laughs> blue whale uh, model they've got in the Natural History Museum, you can see this tiny little dimple if you know exactly oh, where to look. Wow. And that's where the whale, just behind that is where the whale earwax plug is. Right. But it's sealed up now, so it, so it can't yes. get out. But it, but it but is there. I mean, I, yeah, I do think, I just, I just, I'm so delighted that we can start off a, a podcast that is generally about, mundane issues like electric vehicles the future of transportation clean energy <laughs> we're talking about where i think it's brilliant i'm so thrilled but what makes me anxious is do they get le do they get deafer as they get older because there's more <laughs> earwax for the sound oh, to go through we can totally do an entire podcast about whales if you want because i do know um so so basically whales don't hear through the that that channel anymore so um right. the uh odontocetes the toothed whales like dolphins and killer whales they hear through their jaw um, and right. the, the blue whales, the sound actually goes in through the skull. And it's because like our ears right. are full of air. And if you want to get sound, so, so sound kind of reflects off an air water surface. So basically yes. a whale's ear has, did have air on the inside. So the sound right. from the water would just bounce off it. So it's, so the water, so the, the sound has to go the other way around through the skull. Yeah. or through the jaw so um, and actually we do that when we're underwater so next time anyone dives into a swimming pool or into the ocean um you know the sound goes a bit weird it kind of goes like loud yeah. louder and sort of muffled we're hearing through our jaw because because it's right. a little pocket of air in our ears we actually can't hear through our ears yes. underwater and epic to us is really um a topic where um we feel like with a big push you know so if we throw philanthropy investment advocacy at it we can get the ball rolling, something that, that right. doesn't have a lot of momentum, get the momentum up. Or, or at the other end of the scale, something where with a big push, we can just kind of get it done. And right. as you've observed, I mean, EVs must be the lowest hanging fruit um, yeah. in Australia in terms of where, where a big push could get something done. Like, you know, we have the highest take up of rooftop solar in the world, yet right. we import all of our oil, you know. Yeah. We have, you know, pretty expensive oil, um, you know, relative to, to a lot of the rest of the world. But, you know, we've got super cheap renewable energy as well. So, you know, for energy, for a million different reasons, EVs are a no-brainer in Australia. And yeah. yet, you know, at the, at the beginning of 2022, we found ourselves stuck in a position where, you know, less than 2% of new cars sold were EVs. Um, you know, we didn't have any federal incentive schemes to get EVs on the road. Um, we d we're one of, I think it's just us and Russia that don't have fuel efficiency standards. Like, there's a whole lot of reasons why. 
Australia's that, lagging. Sorry, that, I've just because I didn't know that that is an extraordinary fact. <laughs> you need yeah, yeah. vehicle to load and vehicle to grid and those things to do well. There are lots and lots of these these companies, um, and it's like you know it's 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 the beginning of a new race in a way. I, I think 2023, 2024 is almost like the starting guns going off. Who's in who's in position, yeah. and, and some others will be in a in a strong strong position. Um, and it's not to say there won't be some more entrants. I saw Sony and Honda's kind of um, yeah. Vehicle at CS. Yes, I'm very skeptical about that personally, but there are, there might be yeah. some. There might just be about time for some more runners and riders to enter this race as well. But it makes such sense. That was the thing that caught my eye. You went well, Sony. Incredible experience in electronics, in software, in battery management, in you know all that microelectron. I mean, they're, you know, for dec decades and decades, way ahead of very often. We use Sony cameras all the time. That's what the camera crew like using. Uh, Japanese era of domination with electronics and, and car making is now decades old. And that, that's yes, the reality. Yeah. I, you know, I was watching yes, yeah. Tokyo yeah. Vice recently on um, on the BBC, I think it's an HBO uh, series, which goes back to the sort of 1990s Tokyo and the Yakuza and all the rest right. of it. Um, and, you know, and that's an era I know well. It's the era of tape cassettes and you know, yeah. all those kind of high-end electronics, you know, those great looking cars. But that is now, I'm sad to say, I'm aging myself, I'm aging you. That is 30, 40 years yeah. ago. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's it's history, is getting yeah. faster and faster. And it seems to me that Japan finds itself in an in a extremely invidious position as regards the next yeah. wave of, of, of technology. Australia's energy future is, you know, you look, if you, where, where I live is a very, very crowded damp island in northern europe <laughs> and there's not a lot of space but the one thing we have the massive advantage we have in this country is our coastal waters which are owned by the crown the king owns them and and you know the the scale because uh, uh, you know, it's it's out of the general public eye if you live in a city in the uk you're really not aware of the sheer gargantuan scale of offshore wind and of what's going on now i mean they are mind-bogglingly huge so we're very regularly we're, we're between 20 and 60 percent wind powered now depending on the day yeah. today we're about i just checked before i i, I called you we're about 35 percent powered by wind at the moment and what that's done is completely decimate coal in the first place so really coal has been replaced by wind and gas yeah and the other thing we've got and i don't want to be boastful or anything like that is a lot of sunshine so um, a little bit more than what you've got in england so uh, yeah. um so, so yeah, all right don't rub it in <laughs> but, but basically what that means basically what that means in australia um you've got it's rooftop solar so it's the panels on people's rooftops yeah. which is actually pushing out coal and pushing out base load and just changing the whole game so We've got one state, South Australia. I know you've been there because you've been there to their wonderful WOMED uh, festival. Um, we saw yeah. in the distance there um, a few years ago. South Australia is now running 66% um, wind and solar over the year. That's an average over the year, 66% wind and solar. It's unheard wow. of anywhere in the yeah. world. And this is like an isolated grid. It's got one connection into Victoria, which was actually down last week. So even when it was right. completely isolated, it still ran 66%. It has days right. when rooftop solar in the state basically accounts for almost the entire demand in the state. Are you bothered by the, the fashion side of cars and what cars say? And, I, and I've always had that problem. I've always thought, you know, when I had a um, R32 Golf and I'd stop at the motorway services and I'd get out, I didn't think people think I'm cool because I'm getting out of an R32. People think I'm an absolute tosser because I've got this dreadful car with silly exhaust pipes. I mean, we're going back 20 years nearly. Uh, you know, so I've never had that thing that I would feel proud when I get out of a car because look what it says about me. I don't think it's I don't, that's never worked for me. I, and when I see other people, I see a man get out of an EQS. I'm basically yeah. just full of bitter, bitter jealousy. I don't like him. I think, you swine, why can you have one of those? Why can't I? <laughs> yeah, car, your car does say something about you, doesn't it? I think there are cars that I look at and that, that car just says to me, you don't know cars and you've just chosen that because you thought that was, that yeah. was the right thing to choose. Um, yeah. yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that is the problem with a lot of the big high-end expensive stuff, right? Is even if you really want one, even if it's really lovely, you don't really want to be seen in one because it's just, <laughs> it's just downright obnoxious. Yes, yeah. Yes, I think if I had one of those, I would put on fake beard and dark glasses and a hat before I got out of it. 
just yeah. so no one knew. Yeah. But then, so then, here, okay, here's the what we went on to then, because I think it is interesting. So if you, if we move into a world where, you know, I'm, I'm, we're never going to be in a world where no one has private cars, but if we move into a world where a lot of people are very happy using a really good car sharing scheme, you know, with a wide range mm -hmm. of cars that are easily available, that are in your neighborhood, that are electric, that have somewhere to park and charge, you know, the stuff that I saw in Utrecht, that kind of scheme. <laughs> well, I think this is a kind of overlooked, potentially exciting upside of a car sharing future. Audi released these these crazy electric concepts a few years ago. I forget the names of them, but they, they came as a set and they were all designed with car sharing in mind and they were all really extremely designed for one thing. So one was very comfortable for long distance motorway right. driving. One was like a, a dune buggy for off-road adventuring. And right. one was a little tiny city car that was really small. And the thinking behind this is, in a car sharing world, you just pick what suits you that day. Yeah, yeah, and within yeah. that, you, can, you actually might get to experience a whole array of different sorts of cars because you're going on holiday for the weekend. You're like, let's get something cool. You're going yeah. into the countryside for the weekend. You go, let's get something with giant off-road tires and big suspension. Yeah. Imports of gas and oil are from Russia, quite a low amount. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But it, absolutely. It's absolutely. still some billions of pounds a year. It's not like, it is. It's not like, it's not it's not like 40 amount. quid. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, just if, uh, for people listening, if you actually want to think about where the you know the, the molecules that come out of your gas hob, if you have one, yeah. where do those come from? So right now, the bulk of those are coming from the North Sea, but obviously that's yeah. a depleting continental shelf, um, and Norway. And funny yeah. enough, when I was studying in 2016, I've actually stood on the end of the pipe that right. comes this way, right? So um, it's it's one of those things you realise that that's actually where where the gas comes from yeah. we get a whole chunk from lng on tankers that come into the isle of grain and get regasified but right. yeah the, the bulk of it comes from norway and the, and the north sea and the, yeah. the difference comes in from from liquefied national natural gas on on ships i've often seen people do the well why don't we just make our own let's let's start fracking yeah and then you kind of go well one it's going to take time to create an industry yeah to our geology you know you could get a bit of gas from that but that's yeah. an awful lot of disruption for actually very little volumes yeah. but also that price that comes of gas that comes out of the ground it would meet a global or a pan-european gas price so right. it doesn't matter whether you make it here it doesn't yeah. mean that we get it cheaper because it we get it's it out from of here. the ground here right and it's I mean, one I, of those things you yeah you know, you're stuck yeah. really it's yeah. you want the ability to trade globally but the counter to that is you kind of want to keep your own for yourself. Well, yeah, but you can't yeah. have both of those yes. things. Yes. Yeah. From Ford, they're just from the PR department at Ford who were explaining how their TV commercial that they showed at the Super Bowl, how people responded mm -hmm. to that. And it wasn't the man driving up the rufty track or the woman going shopping. It was the, the guy who's, when there was a power cut and he turned his house lights back on. And they said that was just yes. an extraordinary response they got from that. But people wanted that that aspect of the vehicle, you know, way more than anything else, you know, which is. Oh, it's yeah. definitely become one of the most compelling features. And we've been, you know, the advocates have been sort of nudging toward this for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, even back, you know, 10 years ago, almost, I was, you know, I was with a whole bunch of Nissan Leaf drivers in yeah. Japan and the, and the drivers were from around the world and they were going, we would love to have vehicle <laughs> the to inverter vehicle box to have. that you yeah. use in Japan all day long. And, yeah. and Nissan said, no, we just don't see a market in the US or anywhere else for this and they won't pay for wow. it. Yeah. And yet it's been, been one of the most compelling features. And whether you live in our case on the West Coast where you have wild, wildfires and earthquakes or on the East Coast with storms and, and yeah. a lot of the you know central or, areas of the country. Or, or Texas where things. there's snow. Yes. Or Texas. Classic. Yeah. I mean, certainly that became, I think, I, yeah. I mean, in some ways I think that was a useful inflection point in the psychology of folks of you know, yeah. here's yet another massive chunk of the country that is subject to yeah. these power cuts. And the psychological option to have that resilience is very compelling to consumers in a way that automakers just didn't notice before you can imagine i've been i've been making this show now for 12 years the amount of times i've been told there's not enough lithium for all your fancy electric cars uh i can't you know if i had if i had a dollar <laughs> you want to hear it one more time <laughs> yeah yes go on then tell me there's not enough lithium <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, this was a problem that I identified back in 2018. Um, you know, lithium is one of the battery material, one of the battery metals that goes into a battery, right? Yeah. And 
there, there are other battery materials like nickel, copper, um, iron, phosphate, uh, etc. But uh, lithium is a common denominator amongst all battery types. And as opposed to those other metals, lithium has no other huge application, right? right? So copper is used in a lot of different things. Nickel is used in a lot of different things. But lithium was used for like some fringe medication, uh, some glass, and of course, consumer electronics. But then when electric vehicles came into the market, all of a sudden we needed like a hundred X the amount of lithium that we right. previously needed. And whereas all of those other metals had robust manufacturing and production processes, lithium didn't have that. The total right. global production of lithium was like under a hundred thousand tons per year. And then essentially overnight, every single auto manufacturer decided they were going to electrify their fleets and go to EV and we need a hundred X the amount of lithium right. that we are currently producing. So the manufacturing methods were not equipped to be able to produce that amount. And that's what energy X is focusing on a paradigm shift of a new disruptive way that can produce more lithium in greater abundance, more efficiently and more cost effectively. We would discuss, uh, you know, the, the company that makes exactly that, the sway bar. And they, yep. well, they, they used to be brilliant, but now they've really got, yeah. I can't even see what you're talking about. It's underneath <laughs> yeah. the car. I, don't even I couldn't point to it yeah. if you showed it to me. <laughs> Picking it out of a lineup yeah. of parts, yeah. I wouldn't know what it is. So so my, my take, you know, and the reason I evolved from just do, really focusing on the data to, uh, to what I do now is because I realized, and this is a harsh reality for someone like me whose life and career has been dependent on data, is people aren't convinced of things by numbers. Right. We we are humans are are moved and called and and change their mind from emotion. Yeah. And and so so this is where storytelling is the key. Yeah. Right. You, you know, uh, you can watch a documentary on something and how it's done can completely change your perspective on the world. Yeah. That's incredible. But you could I could throw statistics at people all day long about stuff and it it just doesn't matter. So yeah. that's why I kind of evolved my content in that way, because my whole goal is just to get people excited about electric cars. Yeah. So that way they'll they'll get into one, you know, whether it's a, a hundred thousand dollar Porsche or whether it's a used Nissan Leaf, whatever it is, yeah. you know, showing the joy of going electric is really what it's about. Yeah. And I, I try to bring in data and comparison and structure things. But really, it's it's the emotion and the story that I think get people excited but you know three of our buses three of our buses are 1.2 megawatts 1.2 exactly yeah <laughs> three buses yeah of available yeah. power yeah i mean that's i don't know if you know about that it's uh, the federal government in the usa are doing that with their school bus fleet so the i, I, I do know it, yes yeah which yeah. is very interesting because i i didn't realize i remember the very first visit I, uh, when I visited the United States, I was staying with friends in New York State and their children. I'd, I'd never seen it in real life. I was so excited to show you how, how nerdy I am. Their children got on a yellow school bus. I'd never seen one in real life. So I ran out the front of the house to see them get on the yellow school bus and it drove off. But I'd also remember a big cloud of diesel coming out the back of that bus you know, when it drove away, which all those kids were surrounded by. But yeah. uh, so, but that makes so much sense. And when you explain that to people who don't know that, so those buses, they're really busy and it's vitally important that they're reliable and they're on time and they pick loads of kids up and they take them to school and then they go back to the depot where they do nothing for the next yes. seven hours, nothing at all. They just park, they're doing nothing. And then they have to go and, and pick the kids up, take them home. And then they do yes. nothing all night. It's, it's a really good example. And what I smile about with the school buses, and I'm really glad they're doing it, but it's pulling at people's heartstrings. Yeah. You know, here are my kids and they're, you know, it's polluting. Well, the the information about it, however, is they're typically not driving in um, in, in dense areas. So, you know, yeah. school bus isn't typically used as much in a city. Right. It's, it's in the urban areas because they've got further to go. Yeah. Um, they don't drive many kilometers every day. Yeah. Really Set route, isn't it? Yeah. Like we go two, three hundred kilometers in a day. 
yeah. they they go maybe you know 30 to 100 maybe it yeah. would be the most in a full day yeah. and they're out in in where it's distributed you're not getting all this impact so um but they have a lot of uh heartfelt energy and attention because it's it's the kids yeah well yeah. so is all of this this is our next generation and the one after I don't know about your kids, but mine are fed up with us. <laughs> yeah, no, and rightly so. The logistics and the the cost and the people involved to install all those. I'm not talking about the hubs, just the replacement uh, charges on the on the motorway network. Is we it, did them all. Right? I think in about ten months, we changed wow. um, all of the charges on eighty five percent of the motorway uh, in right. ten months. In fact, most of them we did in six months. Um, wow. And uh, it took a little while to kind of work through the other niggles of uh, some of the some of the contracts that we that we inherited, um, but yeah, we got them all done. Uh, and in addition to that, put have now got six, uh, seven, sorry, seven uh, electric super hubs live as well, which is what we call groups of six or twelve, three hundred and fifty wow. kilowatt charges. I mean, does that? I mean, so is there a differentiation between that and say? The, the the hub at Braintree, the one in Norwich, you know, are they are you including those in that figure? Because I don't because those are sort of no, so you're, no, that's, a, that's in addition. Yeah. Um and that's yeah. the model that we're rolling out across the motoring network. Everything we did uh, in replacement of the existing charges uh, was really only seen as a as a sticking plaster um, right. for uh, you know just fixing materially the issue so that people could actually have the ability to charge um, any uh, you know any of the 85 motorway services 85 percent of the motorway services we have charges and do so without right. any stress and anxiety um of course there aren't enough of those charges um and yeah. so the, the real plan has been to you know how come as quickly as possible you know reinforce those so we leave them where they are and then we put in another you know six or 12 and actually we, we think we, we probably need to put in a lot more than 12 at certain sites already exeter a year ago uh we had two charges that didn't really work very well uh, we then fixed right. those with two charges that do work very well. We then added a further 12, 350 kilowatt charges. And, you know, the kind of May bank holiday had people tweeting me going, guys, you know, the, the charges are all full. <laughs> you know, can't you put some more wow. in? Wow. So, wow. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really staggering progress. But, but it also feels that we've only really just got started. Why is the UK doing so badly, if you like? You know, why is the UK so exposed to what is you know it's not just high uk gas prices gas prices are high you know have gone up everywhere. very yeah, yeah. everywhere um but the uk is you, you know almost uniquely exposed to high gas prices and that's for a number of reasons basically uh the uk the uk's homes 85 percent of them are heated with gas yeah that's very high you know somewhere like the netherlands is similar but most european countries are much much lower so, right. you know, so France or Germany, well below 50% of homes use gas for heating. Um, the European average, again, is, is much lower. Right. Um, then on top of that, you've got the fact that the UK's housing stock is is old and leaky. Yeah. Um, we're not unique in having old housing stock, but we are fairly unique in, in having failed again and again over the last decades to actually make progress on on making them less leaky, more, more yeah. cosy, to, you know, and, and cheaper to, to run. So energy efficiency policy has just been a total void um, for a long time. And um, and then on top of that, um, the UK gets a very high proportion of its electricity from gas as well. So like 40% of our electricity com comes from gas. And you know, again, places like Germany and France, way, way, way below that. Right. And so we kind of got this triple whammy, which means when there's high gas prices, we're incredibly exposed to that. Um, and that's you know that's obviously a, a big problem. And then on top of that, there's you know the issue you mentioned, which is that electricity prices across the board are set. It's basically what we call a you know um, it's the marginal generator. So so if demand increases, a new you know another power station has to switch on, and the last one to switch on, the marginal generator sets the price for for, right. all, for all of the electricity sold during that that settlement period. So each yeah. each half hour effectively you kind of settle up and you know the the demand and the supply is balanced and yeah. you know we pay for you know for all of that the other main type of hydrogen comes from uh from from fossil fuel and right. uh, particularly from gas and what you do is if you take uh natural gas and you treat it with very hot steam then hydrogen comes out of that and carbon dioxide right. comes out. So what you're doing is you, the natural gas methane, which is uh, uh, its chemical 
chemical name is uh, its chemical symbol is CH4, which means it's got one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms in a molecule of methane. So when you treat it with hot steam, the hydrogen goes off one way and the carbon gets bonded to oxygen and goes off as carbon dioxide. Uh, now, right. normally, that carbon dioxide just goes into the atmosphere when you when you make methane. Sorry, when you make uh, hydrogen. We make a lot of hydrogen yeah. uh, in the world. 2% of the world's uh, carbon emissions comes from making hydrogen, mostly... Right. From from grey from this sort of hydrogen, uh, where yeah. where the where the emissions just go into the atmosphere, it's called grey hydrogen, uh, and right. mostly it's used for making fertilizer, uh, turn it into ammonia to make fertilizer, and also for treating um, uh, oil products, petrochemical, and the petrochemical industry uses it a lot. Right. So that's called grey um, hydrogen, uh, and right. as I say, it's two percent of the world's carbon emissions. So there's you know, and that's about the same as aviation, right? So making hydrogen currently generates wow. about the same emissions as making aviation. As, as, as flight, as all flights. All flights. You know, I mean, that's right. Wow. Hydrogen is not efficient when it's used in a home, when you burn it like natural gas for heat. It's not efficient for passenger vehicles. It's not efficient for stationary electricity in comparison to just using batteries. And so the fossil fuel industry is actually very gung-ho on hydrogen because they want to produce the hydrogen yeah. from fossil fuels. Yeah. <laughs> this is a way to, you know, this is a classic greenwashing. They say, oh, yeah. we are green because we want to produce hydrogen, but they want to produce it not from electricity that where the electricity comes from wind or solar. They want to produce it from natural gas, which most hydrogen today is already produced from natural yeah. gas. And then they want to just come up with all sorts of useless applications for hydrogen, such as piping it to people's homes to burn it as yeah. opposed to uh, using electric heat pumps, which are much more efficient, much cleaner. You don't don't result in leaks of chemicals into the air. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have to be careful again uh, because, you know, the fossil fuel industry needs to, is trying to re reinvent itself. You know, we're burning all these fossil fuels, but we've paid a farmer at the other side of the world to plant <laughs> 19 trees. And then you find out you'd already planted them. They're already growing there. <laughs> <laughs> or they plant 19 trees in the desert where they've got they've got zero chance of living. I, I can give you the 30 second explanation if you want for people for yeah. your listeners who may who may be a bit baffled by the entire thing. Um, I totally yeah. understand. Um, so basically, the the fundamental concept, like I just said, uh, is that you can emit and then somehow neutralize or offset or cancel it out. So yeah. sometimes it's referring to a physical canceling out of what you've done which is you've added a greenhouse right. gas into the atmosphere or the oceans. And other times it's actually referring to a weird, funky moral neutralization of what you've done. Um, right. So like you're basically requesting forgiveness uh, and balancing out your moral ledger <laughs> um, right. with, I guess, the atmosphere. <laughs> and if that sounds weird, it's because it is weird. Um, so <laughs> basically... 90% of any offsets that you see claimed anywhere, 90 to 95%. Um, if you look at a if you look at a carbon neutral claim or if you look at a company or even a country, 90 to 95% of those offsets are actually from what we call avoided emissions, right? So um, right. I'm Katan, I build a coal-fired power station, I emit one ton, and then I pay someone else who also owns a coal-fired power station, for instance, um, who uh, insists that they were planning to release a ton to not do that. Um, so the wow, end result okay. for the atmosphere, <laughs> yeah, the end result for the atmosphere is that I've added a ton into the atmosphere. Someone else who was going to didn't, but there's right. still a net addition into the atmosphere, which is awful, yeah. right? Like that's, that's what causes global warming is that we keep yeah. piling more and more on top of the stock that's already in the atmosphere. And that's yeah. what heats, heats earth. Now it's, the, the materials that we use in the batteries are dirtier and worse than driving a diesel car for a thousand years. You know, it's like, they're so much worse. And we're going to throw, they're still, we're going to throw the batteries away. There, there will be thousands of batteries thrown into la landfill and solar panels thrown into landfill and wind turbines thrown into landfill. And you're kind of going, well, I, you know, I don't think that's the plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy to see us coming out of a general conversation about 
you know, that EVs would be more polluting or less environmentally friendly than, than fossil fuel cars. We, we had that conversation for a long time yeah. in Sweden and it was just, it was being, it was being put out, you know, in mainstream media, uh, yeah. which, which, you know, uh, I was very frustrated about that. Uh, yeah. But luckily I see that that is now, we're, we're shifting away from that. But we, we still get the type of, you know, these types of um, criticism and, and uh, deflection techniques, I would yeah. say, because that is essentially what it is. People who want and who have interests in sticking with legacy technology, yeah. who are trying to put out these messaging to deflect from, you know, the data and the, and the facts that are on the table that yeah. electric vehicles is the solution we have in the automotive industry to really usher in a new, more sustainable era, a more efficient, a more equal, a more climate neutral uh, way of, yeah. of going about mobility. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, we're trying from Polestar's side to build uh, a company that that uh, is as transparent as we can be, uh, right. to be able also to... to you know, feed this narrative with data and with right. facts and with our, yeah. our know-how about sustainability. Mind-bogglingly reliant on them. And that didn't happen f this month, last year, 10 years ago. It happened 40 years ago. You know, it happened as, as China kind of re-entered the global community, if you like, because it had been like the same as Russia. I think, it, well, I don't know what your phrase was a moment ago there, global community that, that, yes. that's the point of it all so notwithstanding climate change is about the global community yeah. you know we're, we're all going to suffer uh, yeah you know in, in in varying degrees over various timelines um that, that that's that's the point the irony in all this is we are so interconnected what's that old word gaia you know everything yeah, yeah. is connected yeah um, and whether you call it globalization or whatever you want to call it we, we have become so reliant on each other. And then when that chain breaks, you yeah, know, it has a a, right mess. such a significance. Yeah. We're seeing it, obviously, we're seeing it now in, in Europe. Um, yeah. But trying to find a way in which we can stop beating the crap out of each other yeah. you know, becomes the fundamental because everybody in the end loses. You know, yeah. some power or empire, some ambition thinks it's winning or has won yeah. something in the short term. But in the mid and especially long term, everybody's going to lose. Everybody, so, yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like a complete, um, how can I put, idealist, um, but oh, if when are we ever going to stop kicking the out of each other? Yes, would be nice. So <laughs> pathetic. Yeah. I mean, well, there's a thing. I mean, Octopus are doing it now in this country already. And I've done three nights now where I, I don't use any power between, it's usually about 5.30 to 6.30 or 5 yeah. to 6 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, my wife sends me the results and she's in the 90, right. you know, the eight, 92nd percentile. She gets very excited. I'm not sure she's doing it for the money though. I think she's sort of- <laughs> No, no, the, I don't think you do it for the It's only, it's like 50, I, well, I might get like 48 pence. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, exactly. my electricity bill, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> but it's, it, it's a fascinating, you know, because it's at the moment, I think it's in the hundreds of thousands of people that are involved in that. But, it, you know, if you had 10 million households yeah, that that really reduce their consumption just for an hour at night when there is that peak. That would, you know, that's yeah. it's. I think that's the thing that's emerging to me, to my understanding, is the the combination of things. So all those things, like you know, when I've done talks about electric cars, I always start that they're not the answer to everything. Yeah. They're not the solution. They won't make the world better. They're still cars. They're made in factories out of materials we dig out the ground. It's just that when you cycle behind one, you're not breathing in toxic gases. The place that gives me the most confidence in the energy transition where I see that is graduate recruiting. You know, it was, as you right. say, in the 1990s, the sharpest graduates did not go and work for you. didn't want to go in the right? energy. No. Um, no. You go and work for, for Shell. You know, you go and work for BP. You, you know, go on an oil rig in Nigeria and, you, yeah. you know, you build your way up through this international company. You know, they're the biggest companies in the world. The smart, you know, we go through graduate recruiting. I meet, I meet them all at, at Aurora, and um, yeah. th they're phenomenally clever, and they want to play yeah. a role in the energy transition. And the power sector is the place to be. And, and you know, yeah. as I said before, this is not a fleeting. You know, we've got a couple of decades worth of very difficult analytical questions yeah. to to address. So, I, I, you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's going anywhere. 
Um, yeah. But it's uh, it's certainly reassuring. It's like slightly humbling when a bunch of really clever people turn up and you have to, you know, you have yes. to make sure society benefits from their knowledge as well. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that was certainly my experience there. I felt old and stupid at your conference <laughs> because quite a lot of the people I spoke to, I thought, I'm like, my God, you, you know, you're barely out of primary school and you are talking in a language that is so sophisticated and, and yeah. in, well informed and intelligent. I mean, just go, oh my God. Yeah. This is hope. basically my daily experience in, the world in general. <laughs> Feeling yeah. old and stupid. Let's let's think of it this way: What's the scale of 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 the problem in the U.S. Um, if we deploy millions of electric vehicles? This is going to be a problem in Europe. It's going to be a problem everywhere. Yeah. It's a, a vehicle adds to the load. They're yeah. not always drawing electrons, but they do draw electrons, and when they do, they draw them heavily. If you yeah. If you look at Texas of uh, two years ago in February, they had a major meltdown of the grid. That's because it got real cold and everybody turned up their heat. And a lot of people had electric heat. So the load on the system overwhelmed the generation capabilities right. of their system and the system went down, which meant people lost power and it was catastrophic. If you can imagine adding a million EVs to that ecosystem and yeah. they're single directional, they're unidirectional vehicles they're just adding load to a load problem. They just make it worse. And curtailing the load by smart management of the charging only reduces the amount by which they add to the load. It doesn't solve the problem. But yeah. if you had bidirectional chargers and bidirectional vehicles, and you added a million of those to a situation like that, you can now send out a price signal to the vehicle owners, hey, who wants to make a few bucks? Discharge because we are overloading our system over here in you know Dallas, please discharge yeah. for the next 20 minutes and they can solve the problem instead of creating it. So it, it's right. important when we think about the transition to electromotive technology, the impact of that scale deployment of electric vehicles, if they're single directional, bi-directional, it's a hugely different scenario. So there we have it. What a long list of amazing people we've had on the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed that. If you do, let us know because we could do more. We've got certainly got plenty more material to choose from. Uh, and please do, as I said earlier on and ranted on about it, please do leave us a, a lovely review, a five star review on the old uh, Apple podcast thing. It'll be wonderful. And that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening slash watching.